Constructing your life is about much more than just building a bank account. Each week, join real estate entrepreneur and mindset coach Austin Linney as he interviews guests who are constructing their dream lives and impacting the world around them on a daily basis. If you're an entrepreneur or wanting to start a business, or you just want to hear motivating stories of how others have overcome the odds, you are in the right place. And now for your host, Austin Linney. How's everybody doing today, guys? Welcome to Construct Your Life. This is Austin Linney. I have the honor of having uh, Mr. Corey Tolbert here. How are you doing? I'm good. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thank you for coming on. So you sent me a long list of stuff to talk about. Uh, I blacked that out because I just want to... We had an amazing conversation I think we were supposed to have a 30 minute convo and we wound up having like a two and a half hour conversation. So there's a lot to unpack here. Uh, But what I want to do with my, what I always do with my guests is I want to make sure that they tell their story and and kind of start it where they want to. And then we kind of go from there. Yeah. Okay, great. So yeah, as you said, I feel like there's so much that we could talk about. Um, But I think I'll just kind of start with a little bit of background uh, from myself and uh, I, I guess I would say my journey of discovery and uh, choice making and grace <laughs> really began when I was born. Um, I was diagnosed with cystic fibrosis. <laughs> Excuse me, you'll hear me cough sometimes. So uh, for those who don't know what cystic fibrosis is, essentially the nuts and bolts version is that it's a genetic uh, disease that affects all the mucous membranes in the body. So essentially, some of the primary places that it affects are the lungs, the digestive tract, but it really affects the body as a whole. So I was, they did not have the genetic test at that time, uh, but so they had a different kind of test, doesn't matter. I was diagnosed at about uh, two months of age. So at that point, uh, my mother and grandmother, who was there at the time, uh, were essentially told to not expect me to grow up. I think the life expectancy was anywhere from four years of age to 11, kind of depending on which reference you looked at. And so that was kind of my entrance into the world. Uh, I was called a failure to thrive baby. I just wasn't growing. Food would just kind of go straight through me. And uh, that's part of how uh, CF was discovered at that point in time. So I remember, you know, being in, I don't know, intermediate school, maybe third grade, fourth grade or something. And um, my life, like I was pretty, I mean, I was pretty healthy for someone with CF. I took, you know, I had to take pills every day to uh, digest anytime I ate anything. Like I needed enzymes, man-made enzymes to actually digest my food or I would literally starve to death. Um, I was sick a lot, kind of uh, like strep throat, things like that. Um, So kind of sick, sick ish a lot, but but also pretty healthy, pretty quote unquote normal. Um, And I remember, you know, going down to the library because we didn't have our Google phones to look stuff up when I was in. (laughs) That will date me a little bit. Uh, Fourth or you know, maybe fifth grade, but I remember going down to the library and looking up, you know, trying to understand more about CF or cystic fibrosis, so CF for short. And um, at that time, you know, I I kind of snuck down in between wherever I was supposed to be and saw that the life expectancy was, I think from that, that book that I found, it was probably about 11 years old, which I was pretty close to at that point. And so that was, that was definitely like a, oh, I don't even know if I should be looking at this. Um, But a a moment of, oh, this is real. Um, But like I said, you know, fairly healthy-ish. But my first longer-term hospitalization since I was diagnosed as a baby was at about 10 years old. And that was another kind of wake-up call for me, if you will, as a (laughs) 10-year-old. Um, That was an experience that I, um, yeah, I, I, it was, it was surreal. I remember thinking to myself as I was seeing the IV and my hand, you know, after I had gone through what it took to get it in, which was a lot because I had really small, tiny veins. 
um, I remember looking at my hand, you know, and the tubes coming into me and, and going to this machine and thinking, wow, I must be in a movie because this is what happens in the movies. Like that's how my brain kind of worked with it. Uh, but that hospitalization, that first time was a really a pivotal moment in my life, kind of a I, one of my first big choice points, I think. Um, you know, I, I actually made some great friends. I, I met kids in the hospital, um, but I also learned about being a partner in my care. And um, I was doing things like learning how to run my iMeds, which is the machine that's in charge of the rates of the infusions. And, um, you know, I was learning about my schedule. I was learning about which blood tests I had when, which meds I had when, what rate they would be run at. And I was starting to really step into, if I'm going to be okay, I need to have a role and a, and a part in this. Um, so, you know, fast forward, uh, I actually made a lot of uh, close friends with people with CF. I guess there's a lot I could say there, but another choice point I think I had in that was, you know, in making friends, <clears throat> There's a bond. There's something that's incredible there that nobody else can experience because nobody's living through that in the way we were as kids. And so I got really close <clears throat> with some. And um, it also meant that I, I met kids who are a lot sicker than me. And um, it meant that, for, that I would start to experience the loss of friends, friends dying. And I remember the first young... Well, she was a little girl. She was older than me at that point, but she was a little girl. Her name was Jessie, and she was the first one that I knew that passed of CF. But there would be many, 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 many more. And um, one of my best friends who I was closest with at that point in time, his name was Jeff Moore. And I was 12, and he was 13 when he passed. And I I was devastated. Um, you know, I felt so many things. I felt... Uh, fear, you know, this person, this young man had just died of something that I have, this little boy. I need to stop calling him young man. He was a little boy at that time. You know, I was a little girl. Um, but also, so some fear, some guilt, you know, why he was passing and I wasn't. Um, and that he was sicker than I was at that point. I'm sorry, my cat just climbed into my lap. <laughs> and... Um, yeah, so fear and and guilt um, were two big things, but then also deep, deep loss. And so one of my choice points at that time that I started to make was, you know, I'm not going to make any more friends with CF. I don't want to go through this anymore. I don't want to go through this kind of loss anymore. And um, then there's something else that stepped in in me, you know, after a little bit of time that said, you know, love that love, that kind of deep love, like that's worth it. That's, that's worth any loss you're going to have, any loss you're going to experience. And that connection that I had, that precious time to be able to feel into was worth it. And so it was another choice point for me to say, okay, how am I going to, you know, 12 or 12 ish years old, how am I going to live into this life? What am I going to choose? Am I going to shut down? And I literally remember thinking this. Or am I going to stay open? And I chose to stay open. And, you know, I would meet um, many more people. There are three that were particularly close to me, um, which I, I lost, um, or we lost. <laughs> but I would not trade that time with them for anything. And I know that my heart is richer and deeper and fuller for being able to have that yes. And so... That, um, you know, th that was an aspect of kind of growing up with CF and having those friends and those choices. Um, by the time I was in high school, I was averaging probably about uh, two times a year in the hospital for at least two week stretches at a time. I, um, I had had probably about four or five sinus surgeries at that point. Uh, I you know, I was holding my own, but I, I was clearly, you know, CF was much more a part of my life. I, something like for someone with CF, something like a cold could send us into the hospital. It could spiral into something that could send us into the hospital. Um, 
so I had to be careful, you know, with things like that. Um, I, when I was sick, like I could look normal. I mean, you might hear me like coughing and stuff a lot. And I'll talk a little bit more about why I'm not now, but, um, I would have all nighters, you know, coughing, the kind of cough till you puke. I mean, that was a part of my reality at, at different points in time. I was okay, but um, it took a lot to be okay. And by the time I was 19, I, I had witnessed the cycles of what Western medicine says is um, makes sense for people with CF at that time. It has since changed a bit, but and I had experienced it in my own life, and I was getting sicker. Um, there was also a lot of other stuff going on in life, which is a whole nother thing we could talk about. Um, but also, you know, some of my own choices around there and what I was looking at in terms of, you know, if I'm, if I'm going to die anyway, um, you know, maybe I do it on my own terms. Um, I had lost a lot of friends because there's a lot of uh, pushing of of drugs, which is important, you know, like they, they helped us to survive, but you also get to, there can be a mentality of, uh, the ease of drugs without taking some also responsibility for the rest of the picture. And I also lost a, a number of friends to, uh, narcot narcotics through the avenue of, uh, care, <laughs> Uh, through the hospital and the pills and the layers and layers of medications. And so I was kind of at one of those choice points for myself. And um, I decided to sort of take my health care into my own hands. And again, this was probably around 19-ish or so in through probably my early 20s. And I started really looking at whole care. So what else can I do? So really looking at diet looking at herbal medicine, looking at homeopathy, looking at energetic medicine, looking at how my mental, emotional uh, state, my physical affects my physical state. I started kind of taking some responsibility for my feelings, you know, what, what I was feeling and discovered parts of myself that I didn't even know through some of that initial kind of taking responsibility and that discovery and and just really learning about myself and learning more about what I could do, what I can bring to the table as this, this body, this life, this spirit that, yes, has cystic fibrosis, but also is so much more. And I started to do a lot better. You know, there was a point where I was actually, like I said, I was averaging probably about twice a year in the hospital. Um, but I actually was able to stay out for almost four years at a point. And... Um, in all honesty, I probably should have gone in sooner than when I did. I also had some pride going there, I think, and um, a refusal. Um, and I just think that was part of it. You know, my pendulum had to swing uh, in order for me to come back and kind of reintegrate. But I was really sick uh, when I did go in. And um, so then I, you know, I continued... Uh, again, was kind of averaging after that kind of four-year stretch, was starting to integrate different things and re-accept different aspects of Western medicine also. I mean, I never could totally, I never totally left Western medicine. Let's just be clear. I'm incredibly grateful for Western medicine. I wouldn't be alive without it. I couldn't eat without it. Like, so clear there. But I, I was trying a different way. Um, and then I came kind of to a place of integration and I'm still working of integration of those things. Um, but without making those choices that I had made, I feel very clear that, you know, that time around like nine, my 19, my early twenties, I do not think I would be alive very clearly without making some of those important choices that I needed to change. One of them was huge around diet. Um, that that really did change my life and has allowed me to kind of start to be in the position I am now. And I, I think also an important part of my survival, I mean, is grace, <laughs> but also being able to uh, shift into thriving versus just surviving. So with cystic fibrosis, particularly before this past year, 
you do a lot of work. A person does a lot of work just to not die. Like it's not to get better because it doesn't, well, it doesn't, it's not supposed to get better, right? But for example, you know, my, a life, what I do right now to survive is in the morning, there's at least two hours of prep of treatments, medications, getting things ready for the day, set up for the day that I will be doing throughout the day. Um, there's every other month, there's five nebulized treatments in hell today that I'm doing throughout the day that I'm managing, that I'm integrating into the rest of my life. And every other month, it's two to three. The, all of this is just well care. If I'm sick, it's a whole nother layer. Mm -hmm. um, so I say that, you know, and it's, and it's also not just the hospitalizations. You know, I've had bleeds from my lungs in, in public places. Um, I've had points where I, you know, I thought I was going to, I literally thought I was going to die. I mean, my mortality has been in my face many, many times. Um, but that that mentality of, you know, I'm doing all this so that I don't die. And there was a lot of, you know, in the medical clinic that I came from, a lot of, we need to get on top of this before, they didn't say before it kills you, but essentially it's before it kills you. I mean, that's what all the IV antibiotic round treatments, the multiple treatments are for, is to try and save your lungs, essentially, sometimes at the cost of the rest of your body, from you kind of drowning in your own mucus, essentially. Um, but I, I've had, you know, another uh, a series of kind of choice points around that where um, I made this conscious choice to shift from that survival mentality to actually all these things that I do each day, all these conscious choices that I'm making in my life, those are so that I can live. Like those are so that I can, you know, not always, but many times do the things I want to do. Those are so that I can dance. Those are so that I can have this conversation with you and be able to breathe through it. Those are so I can enjoy, you know, what this life has to offer and to recognize that like this life with quote unquote compromise is actually also, it's, it's beautiful. Like it's full and there's there's gifts that have come with it like I have perspective I had perspective as like a kid you know when when girls were being mean to each other and calling each other names and they cared about what boy did this I mean I cared too right but I also was like yeah and there's so much more you know, with with CF, I I have had a lot of time in the hospital, more than I can even tell you or count. But through that, I've learned I've learned how to be through with procedures that people normally use anesthetic for without anesthetic, being able to rely on my breath, my focus. I have been able to, I've witnessed, I've been with a friend, a dear friend in love as he was dying, literally through PPE gear, through masks and gloves and gowns before COVID or anybody was talking about any of this stuff. I did it and I did stuff that I didn't know that I could or I would be able to, but I was able to kind of put one foot in front of the other and be in it and meet it and then see that I can survive that. And so those are like some of the gifts of living with that. Um, I've, I've learned how even just being in a hospital bed, laying in a hospital bed in the wee hours of the night, like listening to the beeping and the insanity, how I still, like I have something to offer there. I... I can choose, like I had this experience at one point where I literally felt myself, I felt the choice, I felt myself just radiating light and radiating light out for the other patients, for the other caregivers, for the hospital itself. Like I've seen how much can be still offered when it feels like when others might look at the situation and, and feel like maybe that person doesn't have that much to offer or isn't doing that much. But we are. But the thing is, we are all the time. 
you know, just even, just even having this conversation with you. So yeah, I feel there's so much more I could say, but is there anything that you want? No, I I think you won the record. That's the (laughs) longest I've been quiet in the history of my life. (laughs) There's so much to unpack there. Thank you. Extremely Mm -hmm. powerful. Something that came to mind for me is that you said that you dove back into those relationships with people that you knew you would probably lose. And the one thing that sprung into my mind is that you in that moment, maybe it'd be a year, six months or two years or four years, probably had more of a connection and a real relationship than people that are friends for 70 years. Mm -hmm. Because you're probably more real with yourself because the, the aspects of time matter so much more to somebody like you. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. And so it's like one of the things I think is like on the surface, what I appreciate about somebody who has health who or health issues or or whatever you want to call them, like the labels. Right. And that's what one of the we're getting on my new podcast. We're starting one of the conversations on Thursday is about labels. Like I was labeled an alcoholic and I was labeled a method addict and when we break those labels ourselves, it doesn't mean that they're broken for other people. Mm-hmm. And so you got labeled as a person who wasn't going to advance. And yet here we are. How old are you today? I'm 41. 41 fucking years old. Mm-hmm. You've been amazing places. You've met amazing people. Do you think, and not from an ego place, but do you think that you've lived a richer life in that short amount of time because of the perspective you had as a kid than some people do their whole life because they're just getting by. Yes. Yes, I do. And I feel like that is one of the gifts of cystic fibrosis. Like cystic fibrosis has been an incredible teacher, um, hard, hard teacher, but incredible. And that that's one of the gifts. Like I got to know that. And that's part of what I also share with other people is like, hey, look, like we're all going to die. We are like you could walk out and get hit by a bus tomorrow. Mm-hmm. You could this afternoon. So to to I think so many times people avoid looking at death or looking at kind of some of the hard stuff. And the gift of is when you do, then there's this there's a preciousness that emerges that's actually here all the time. It's just that we we start to witness it. And, you know, as a kid, I, I started thinking about what am I going to, what am I going to leave behind? How, how am I going to be remembered, you know, as a, as a young person? And so that has changed and, and matured and, you know, then. <laughs> well, it's interesting. You brought up something and I read something this morning, a, a, a amazing book on the psychology of money and, and people's behavioral patterns and something I find as I go down the road, my, my, my girlfriend's big into holistic healing and, and no medicine and stuff like that. They were talking about how a fever is the way that a body regulates the system to get better. But yet in society, we've chosen to treat that as I don't want to be uncomfortable for one minute. Give me an Advil. Mm-hmm. And one of my favorite things in the entire world, because I fast, I just did a 24 hour one yesterday, is they said, you want to fix your gut just don't eat. And it fixes itself. The absence of something actually makes something better, but we don't, you know, that my analogy for this is when, when a great song comes, we find a new good song, the radio just bastardizes the shit out of it and you don't want to hear it anymore. We have become a society of consuming and running away from uncomfortableness Mm -hmm. instead of diving into it. You with your, your lifestyle and what you've chosen, you don't have a choice. And so I think it's made you a stronger human. And also there is some beauty in polishing the diamond per se. Mm -hmm. Well, I would like to uh, maybe just challenge a little bit what you said when you said, I don't have choice because. Who? You or I? Me. What? Oh, did did I say that? I think you said that. I think so. Well, I apologize. It's not what I meant. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so. But I think that's perfect. You know, we, it's, well, I guess none of us have choice in a sense that we're gonna, 
It's going to happen. Like, it's one thing that can't be avoided. If you're alive, you're going to die, right? It's there. So why not? Like, why not mine it? Why not... Why not dive in and see what's actually here? Like there's a, there's a gift in everything. And I know that sounds like kind of cliche and there's been points in my life where I'm like, I don't ever want to hear that. Like, but it's true. Like it is, it's really true. And you always have choice. You always have a choice. Even if that choice is simply, how am I going to react to this situation? What am I going to choose now? And in finding that, there's, there's just, there's stuff that opens up that you can't even imagine would ever open up if you weren't brave enough to look. And what I love about you and what we talked about, and you could talk more about kind of what you focus on these days and, and what you, who you help, but there's a lot of people that would be selfish with their time as they, you know, a lot of people are selfish for their time, you know, as you get busier and busier, um, I give back. I love to give back. You know, that's a big part of me. And I love that that's part of you and, and kind of tell people what you do and, and kind of the aspects that you I, I know that you get true passion from is, is the is the giving back part. Yeah, that's that's definitely true for me. So, yeah, for me, I that's part of how I also inspire and motivate myself. It's part of um, it's part of what I love seeing somebody kind of discover something or learn about how they actually can help create um, something that they want or something that they want to move from. And so, again, like I I guess I'm going to talk about the gift, some of the gift of the exposure and CF and what I've had is that I do have some perspective and um, I know how to do hard work. (laughs) And I know how to um, sort of pull the gems out of myself. And so that's part of what I do for others and have done, whether that's through I've done advocacy work for the Cystic Fibrosis Family Connection, ended up actually being the president and running that, not because I planned to, but because it needed to be done. So that's also another thing that kind of comes up a lot is like, if it needs to be done and I can do it, I'm just going to do it. Like, it, it just... That's how it is, you know, and um, I do work one on one with patients and families. Also, I have a small uh, business. It's called Booster Jots, which is essentially labeling, which we would I want to talk to you more about that. (laughs) But it's it's labeling by choice. And so you choosing part of what you want to bring into your treatments and into your life, whether it's through labeling a bottle, a bottle of water energy or whether it's labeling a medication, love or, um, you know, whatever it is. So we could kind of go down that road, but, but that's a part of, that's a part of what I do is, is teaching people that, Hey, okay, you have choice. If you can't find it, let, let's work together. I'll help you. Um, and also a choice in how to be with our bodies movement. I invite people into different explorations through the body, um, one thing actually I think is worth mentioning too is that, uh, you know, around that same time, 1920, I, when I was changing things for myself, I decided to leave what was the conventional kind of supposed to do with going to college and getting the, you know, I did go, I started college, but like the whole like four year, blah, 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 la, la, la be in huge debt. And I said, no, like that actually doesn't make sense to me. I want to, I want to start to be able to do work now. You know, yes, I don't know how long I'm going to live. And that was a part of it, but I was really passionate about learning what's possible with our bodies. And so I went to massage therapy school and, um, because of that, I was able to come out and I was start, I was able to start a career so early. I was like the youngest person in massage therapy school. Um, but I was doing it. And because of that, then I got to explore all these different avenues of what we could do with the body. And then that education beca- became tax write-offs because it was a part of like my career and what I was doing. Mm-hmm. And so um, that is one avenue and one way that I work with people too is um, you know being able to not just meeting the restrictions in life, but restrictions mm-hmm. in their own body. And oh so that's God. one way. Don't I, I, the timing is impeccable. All right. I've been feeling like very stressed. Like we moved a bunch, like I'm the businesses, I'm getting them up and running. And, uh, I reached out to a buddy of mine who's a contractor, but he's a body worker. He's a fascist guy. And I said, I need you to find me somebody. 
So this guy comes over and he's like two minutes in. We're like, I mean, we're talking about business life. And he's like, dude, this is the weirdest thing. He's like, I always find my people and like, I'm going to help him with his stuff. And like, he's going to help me with my body work. And he's coming over again on Thursday. And like, we were talking about my alcoholism and he and I was saying like, there's a lot of toxins in my body. And he says, no, 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 no. I want you to reframe how you say that. There's not toxins in your body. The body is very powerful. You're, those things were gone in 72 hours. Mm. You have trauma toxins from the abuse of the mindset of alcohol. And we, and we have to release <laughs> those from your body. And I was like, <sighs> yes, yes. Oh, oh, there's so much. There's so much. There's so much. <laughs> But okay, so so yes, I our body absolutely holds tissue memory. I mean, there's so much. Well, we just watched we just watched that blew my mind. I, I literally I've never talked about this on the podcast that water has memory. Oh my goodness, Austin! Oh, we have to talk, man. Yes, forever. Yes, yes. I was teaching, so I also taught at the massage therapy school. Eventually, um, was teaching my students to be conscious with their water. I'm conscious with my water every day. Yes, we have so much more to talk about, but I want to not forget. Yes. No, we're I, gonna we're gonna go back. Yes. Okay, I want to not forget that piece that you talked about. You know, um, the uh, trauma toxins. So one thing I want to say about that is that. I feel like one of the most important things we can do in our lives is to have integrity with ourselves. Mm -hmm. And so each time we are now, each time we have some new information or we're made aware of a choice and we, we don't, we don't have integrity in it. Even if it's a small little piece that, that starts to kind of pick away at the foundation of what we actually have to bring to the table, what we actually can move with. And I think, you know, if I had to say like one single thing, I would say two things. If I had to say two things to people that I think are, no matter what you're facing, no matter what challenge you're facing or what, what you have, what you have going on in your life is like, find your choice and then have integrity with yourself around how you're going to move from there. Because if you have that, it doesn't matter. You could be laying in a hospital bed. You could be in the dirt. If you have integrity and you know that you've made the choice that feels the most life-giving, solid, you know you've done the best you can in that moment, like you've already won. It doesn't, the results don't matter as much. And so when you talk about that trauma toxin, I feel like that's a part of that conversation is refining integrity. Well, more importantly, society on its whole is making decisions based on emotion from a previous feeling that's mm. fake. Mm. And so we don't, we're sitting in our decisions and we're not even making the decision best for us until we do the inner work to get down to the core of what we truly know we need to be. Yes. Yes. So many times we don't even know. So many times we don't, we don't even know. We don't even know what we want. I mean, I have to, I have that challenge repeatedly. It's like, okay, what's actually, forget all this, 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 what you have to do, what you should do, what this needs to be done, and what, what you know, do I actually Well, want? what I have them do is I have them make a decision regardless of money decisions or where they live. Like, what, mm -hmm. what if none of those things were a thing and we just make a decision here? Well, that doesn't make... That doesn't make sense in this moment. Well, I know, but that's the actual decision that we need to make. And when they make it from there, it feels so heart centered opposed to I'm doing this for my spouse or money reasons. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think I would too throw into that mix is like, what would you do? I mean, I'm sure you've probably heard of this exercise or done this, but like, if you're going to die, you're going to die in five years. You're going to die in one year. You're going to die in one month. You're going to die in five days. But when you get down to that piece of like one day, 24 hours, what would you, what could you do right now? What would you do right now if you knew you only had that 24 hours? And again, like one of the gifts of my life is that I've, I've had some of that, you know, I've, I've had that that those moments where I didn't know if I was going to live or die, you know, so I have to ask you a question, not to put you on the spot. Mm -hmm. If that's the case, is Corey living a hundred percent what she would do in that 24 hours? 
Mm, so yeah, good. Thank you. Thank you for putting me on the spot. <laughs> I think so. I mean, I think right now, yes. Right your, your, now, your face tells me you are. Yeah. Right now, the answer is yes. And if I'm going to be totally transparent and honest, that is not true in every moment. You know, I, I have to refine. And I think that's part of my work is like refining that alignment. And that's a part of what I'm, I'm doing right now um, is because the truth is it's different. If I was going to die in 24 hours versus if I'm going to die in five years, I would do things a little differently, you know, mm -hmm. like I'd plan a little differently. But again, I've walked that partially I've walked that my whole life. Like, you know, do I want to plan for retirement? Like, what's the use if I'm not going to be there? But yeah, just in case, maybe I do want to, you know, and so it's, it's kind of finding that line of um, what makes sense and how do I do both? Like, how do I, how do I say yes to my future and yes to right now and that moment of integrity? And how do I dance that dance? And I think it's a continual inquiry, really. That's, yes. And so I want to get on it because I know you. This is, this is a topic I haven't explored much. We're going to have you on my other podcast too. And you're going to lose it because we only talk about stoicism and philosophy and death and mindset. It's all crazy. But talk about your description of like, how people, what I find people do is they not only get labeled, but they also live their label on, mm. on a stake. Right. Mm. And so my favorite quote in the world, one of my favorite quotes is you better position yourself or you will be positioned. Mm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's it's essentially, I mean, it's up to us. And yeah, I mean, I can't tell you how many times like I will offer something out and people, if they see it through the lens of um, instead of this is a human sharing her experience, like this is someone who has cystic fibrosis um, or someone who, you know, has a chronic illness and oh, well, you know, she she's different because of that, right? And and so she can do that. But if you do that from the outside looking in, then you're actually missing, you're missing it. Like you're missing the opportunity to identify and to see yourself in me and see what you might also be capable of because you're, you're, you're putting me in a box, right? And then for me, if I'm living into, and, and this is some of the reason why, you know, I've been a little bit resistant to talk about CF in some points. And when I did the advocacy work, I walked that line very carefully because I didn't want to become a poster child for CF, both for the, the totality of who I am, but also for me, because it was important to me to continue to strive to see how much more I am and what else I can offer into the world. And you know what? Yes, yeah, CF is a huge part of my life. It influences a huge part of my life. But there is way more to me. Like, I've got some dude, other complicated shit. Dude, you know dude, what I'm saying? Like, well, dude, you'll love this conversation. And we, you know him, mutual friend, Dylan uh, Slaughter, been through cancer twice. He said that he had to get out of the cancer space because they were sitting in the room comparing who had cancer worse. And he's yes. like what the fuck is going on? He's like, this doesn't even make sense. We yeah. could be impacting life and you're over here deciding whose cancer was worse. Yes. And I, I would imagine in the same space for you sometimes. Yes, absolutely. Yes, that has totally been my experience. And again, it's part of like why I do some specific work with the CF community and I make sure I get myself out of the CF community. Um, it's It's so important. It's so important. And... Also, I mean, there can be definitely some victim mindset in some of this. And yeah, it's hard. It's hard, man. But um, I don't think commiserating and that piece of it really helps us in the end. It does help. It does help sometimes to be with someone who knows some of the depth of what it takes, right, to live in this way from this condition. I and just don't want to I just don't want to hang my yes. whole life on it. Right. Absolutely. And so we're, yeah. we started, it launches next week. We started with one of my mentors. He runs one of the bigger charities in the country. 
Uh, we started a One Life Fully Lived uh, recovery group. Mm -hmm. And I didn't get uh, sober through 12 steps. A lot of the guys did, but they hated 12 steps because it was very, like you said, commiserated, very negative. And so, look, I'm not an addiction specialist. I just got healthy the only way I knew how I could. Mm -hmm. But what I can't stand is like, and there's a moment to say it and you say it, but if you're two or three or six years sober and you're still saying that you're in recovery or like I'm a former alcoholic, like remove yourself from said label and, and, and like understand that you've now moved on to a different part of your life. But here's the kicker. And I would love to hear your thoughts on this. What I found when people change, whether it be addiction or how they feel about their father or something happened in their childhood, this is the part that that's the rub creating the new identity of who they are becoming is so fucking scary because they're so comfortable in their cocoon that that part of the change is actually the hardest. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. I, yes, <laughs> I keep saying yes, but yes. Um, so there's something about, so I, I am someone who has I will say almost always, more often than not, chosen to not use CF as an excuse. And so to find how I can still, sometimes to the detriment, like sometimes it's I've gotten really sick by pushing too hard, right? But, um, but also, actually, when push comes to shove and I'm in the hospital and, you know, the shit has hit the fan... CF has allowed me to say, you know what? I'm sorry. I can't. Like, I'm literally going to die. Like, I can't, right? It and almost so, gives you that. Ugh. Right. Yep. And and so I'm what I'm in the process of doing right now, too, and it's a long process, it's lots, is finding what is true for me regardless. Like, what's actually, what's what's my no for me? you know, or what's my yes for me, regardless of whether I have CF right or not. So CF is a part of the equation of me, but like what's, what's true independently of that? And to be able, so here's the kicker, to be able to stand in that and say, actually, this is just true for me because of who I am and because of what I'm choosing right now. And to not lean into, you know, because I'm sick or because I have CF. And one thing I didn't really speak to, um, which is a longer topic, so the, the mini version is that, so I have an opportunity in my life right now because of a new drug that has come along. And the fact that I can even be in this conversation with you and not coughing all through it is, is a testament to that. I, wouldn't, I don't think I would be here had I not made the choices in my life that I made to get here. Mm -hmm. And grace. Um, however... I now might have an opportunity to maybe get better-ish. Like I will have CF, but my life could look different. And so there is that reevaluation point of, well, who am I if I'm not dying right now? Mm. You know, and, and who am I if I'm not going to end up in a lung transplant? And, and, you know, Rick and I, my partner and I, we've even had the the conversation of, you know, when he said yes to – committing to me in this time, it was like, and he's probably going to lose me. And, and after, you know, Trikafta has come along and some stuff, it's like, well, I actually might live. What do you think? Do you still want to be with me? You know, but I mean, it's funny, but it's part of the reality. It's like it, the, the opportunity to step in and. Well, it's one of the things, and you know, me and him are friends. It's one of the things I pressure up against him about is that we have to look on, on a scale of the wants and needs, and this is where relationships get tricky. The wants and needs of one said partner and the time frame. this isn't investing in everywhere, and the other partner are two different aspects of value propositions to view, right? Mm -hmm. And so we have to make sure that we're meeting our partners in the middle and we're having the open conversations to say, you know, what is it that you truly want? What is it that... Because this is where I look at it, right? And I say like, oh, okay, well, I'm two years ahead. Well, that person might be 20 years ahead looking at it. And so how can you judge them on the viewpoints that they're looking at when they're two different time frames? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's so important. That's so important. 
I think to um, this piece that you're talking about or that you you spoke to around making the choice of like who you who you want to be kind of for you and in changing your identity. There's something about like being able to whether it's with that par- the partner and being real about like okay what is my goals what are your goals but also like yeah it's it's part of that integrity I think like being able to stand in you know who I am right now and to not and to 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 be brave enough to acknowledge that that has changed can change will change but to be brave enough to be to step into that like one example you know for me sometimes i've been like you know i'm sicker than sick like i'm in the hospital i'm and i still have trouble still have trouble not you know saying, you know what, I'm not going to do this or I can't do this or I'm not going to fix it for you. Like I've had a, a number of people in my life that I like hold things together for, you know, but it's like I could literally be like it, not able, hard to breathe, not able to breathe and still trying to figure out how I'm going to be there, you know, for that person. So to be able to to not have to be, to not have to be dying to say this is who I am. Like if I'm dying, then I'm pushed to the place, right? Where it's like, oh, wait, no, this is actually what's important. But to not, to be able to do it before you're dying or whatever it is, to be able to do it before you're maxed out, to say, actually, this is what I'm choosing in my life right now. And I think it's part of that identity conversation. Well, you're in a, in a separate context, such a powerful conversation. What I view as the lack of decision meaning making a choice that it's aligned with 100% your vision and who you are might actually be a better choice than making the decision. And so I've had to turn away, just in the context of my life, I've had to turn away probably 20 properties in the last like seven months for Airbnb because it didn't fit with my lifestyle the way I saw it forward. Mm-hmm. And what, what happens is in the same week, three of the right properties that we want close. And now my life is forever changed. And I'm thinking to myself, like if I would have took those and taken the quick money and done what I would have done in the past, I wouldn't be available for these. Yes, 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 exactly. Yes. And it's so, it can be so scary, right? Like as my coach would say, walking down a hallway with (laughs) no doors and the lights are off. Mm -hmm. Yes. Scary. Yeah. Real scary. But if we're brave enough to do it, then it opens up. The it, universe it can... is asking you how bad do you want it. Yes. Ugh. It's it's putting you <laughs> against the mat and saying, We're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna 10x you, we're gonna 20x you, but you gotta hang on. And when you have no doubt, you gotta mm. hang on even farther. <laughs> mm. You gotta mm. hold on and you gotta you gotta go to the desert, you gotta spend some time by yourself, you gotta meet amazing people, you gotta work on yourself, mm-hmm. but you gotta. I was, you know, talking about this before we jumped on the call. Crazy year, crazy year for me, divorce, laid off, move across the country. But what I had was my workouts and what I had was my time with myself. And I hung on those and got stronger in the moment and started making decisions. And there was despair and there was the bank account got down to like nothing. And then like, then a lot of money came in and then the money went away. And, but what I've realized when I was riding back from that property yesterday is that through pure fucking fireballs and dynamite and fucking, you know, addiction and all this stuff and fight real, real grit. I have constructed no pun intended. Sorry. It's just, it's uh, Mm -hmm. the lifestyle and in business with the people that I want to do business with which I think you can't put a number on like, you know, we met because of Leland, like to do business with that human, like to run his properties, to know that he respects what we do and sees the value in it and wants to see us succeed as much as he wants to succeed. Mm-hmm. Man, that's that You can't put a price tag on that in business. No, you can't, you can't. But first you have to be brave enough to find out what's actually true about me. 
Mm. and to peel those layers back. And because if you don't know what's true about you, then you're going to be called into the next thing that's true about somebody else or somebody thinks that that's true about them. So that piece of doing the work, like it, to know what am I actually carrying around? Like, what am I actually holding on to? What actually matters to me? Who am I? Like, who am I? Just ask even that question. Who am I? Who am I? Who am I? Knowing that it can change in any moment. But if you find like that seed, you just keep, keep like gardening and watering that in like, because without that, you can't, well, you can, but it'll be temporary like everything is, our lives. But that like, to me, I feel like that has to be kind of like the guiding post to connect us to all these, uh, these opportunities. I need to meet, introduce you to somebody, uh, Carolyn Colleen, one of, she runs a network of women, amazing coach, doctor. She said something to me that changed my life when I interviewed her. And I realized it's what I did when I got sober. She said when she got divorced and she was a single mom and she was rough and it was rough and she could, couldn't afford it. She said she, didn't love herself enough to change, hmm. but she borrowed the love from her daughters long enough to believe in herself. Yes. Yes. I did that, except I don't have kids. So there was a point I was in a relationship. Oh God, we could talk about this stuff for a long time, but <laughs> I made a lot of choices that I needed to make to get me to the place I am. And, you know, God bless them all. They were not always life giving. And, um, there was a point where I was, I knew I needed to get out of a relationship. And part of that, what I, I sat myself down on a stool and I said, what happened is I imagined having a child with this person. And I said, and I knew what I went through like as a kid and we, that's another topic. But I was like, for the love of that life, that's what got me out of that relationship is the yeah. love of a baby I didn't even have. But to say, would I want this for a child? And the answer was no. And when I couldn't say no for myself, and it took number of times, I said no for that child. And, you know, that child is not here, but that child is part of what, what helped me, the idea to leave and to say yes to myself. But I, mm -hmm. yeah, just exa I needed something, something more than what I knew myself to be in that moment to, in order to leave that situation. And a tactical way, guys, to understand that. And I live by it. I met an amazing businessman who is an amazing human. He said, I wake up every day and I ask myself, how can I thank my 55-year-old self? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He said, what can I do today to make that guy's life that much better? Mm-hmm. And, yes. you can, and you can get 1% better every day and you can love somebody and you can ask them if they're okay, really ask them if they're okay and understand that transactional relationships and transactional business will only get you so far. When you get to that end of that road or that nice car or that big house, you're still going to be unhappy. And so you got to do the work. You got to put in the work like you have we're going to have you back because we, we could talk about it for three hours. We're going to have you on the other podcast. Like, I just want to tell you, and hopefully you don't start crying, but when I meet people like you, it makes me happy to be alive. And it makes me centered in the work that I'm doing matters because there's a lot of content and there's a lot of podcasts. There's a lot of meetings and I don't, I hope that when people listen to this, they understand that it's a woman that has fought her whole life and is not making excuses on who she is, but stepping into who she knows she is. Mm -hmm. And it's my gift. And that's why I put out the content that everybody steps into who they are. And so I commend you and get inspired every day thinking of, the, the woman that you are and, and have become. Mm, thank you so much, Austin. That means a lot. Thank you. Thank you. It's the truth because we have a finite amount of time on this earth. 
I wasted, not wasted, but went through some stuff for other people <laughs> to help them. And I, I want to make sure that everybody takes a moment and stops for two seconds and business is good and deals are good, but make sure that you understand why you're doing them. And if it's, if it's in line with who you are and what you believe in, then it's a go. It's good. And you can go and you can work 17 hours a day and you can do all that. Like I had nine coaching calls yesterday. I, it's okay for me because I love what I do. But like everybody looks at that and they go, well, dude, what the hell are you doing? And I'm like, well, I have off Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. <laughs> <laughs> like it's, it's, it's calculated. Right. And so if, if people want to find out more about what you do and who you are, how would they do that? So you could go to myfluidnature.com. That would be probably one of the best places. Also, if you want to know more about the booster jots or labeling con concept, that's uh, boosterjots.com. I love it. And we'll put all that in the show notes. And uh, guys, if you like this episode, make sure you send it out to your friends. We really appreciate y'all for listening. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you for listening to Construct Your Life with Austin Lenny. If you enjoyed this episode, be sure to rate, review, subscribe, and pay it forward by sharing with a friend. Most importantly, take this opportunity to start constructing your life by taking immediate action on what you learned. For show notes, resources, and more information on one-on-one -on -one coaching with Austin, visit constructyourlifepodcast.com.